this is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. Our guest this week is journalist Rachel Slade, who looks at the challenges of manufacturing goods in the United States through the lens of a sweatshirt company in Maine. She's interviewed by author and New York Times editorial board member Farah Stockman. This is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. If you read nonfiction books and thought-provoking discussions with authors spark your interest, you'll find the Book TV newsletter a valuable learning resource for staying informed. Hi, John here, one of the producers at Book TV. Think of the Book TV newsletter as your weekly literary update, your source for advance notice of program highlights, featured book festivals, and in-depth profiles of nonfiction authors. Explore the Book TV newsletter to organize your viewing and ensure you never miss a significant literary event. Be a Book TV insider with our weekly newsletter because Book TV is television for serious readers like you. Subscribe today at cspan.org slash connect. That's cspan.org slash connect. The forest doors are everywhere you are. So just pop in when you need a brown lip to match your 90s playlist. A confidence boost before your interview. Or a last minute gift for mom's birthday. There's always a Sephora near you. Just pop in. Use our store locator to find your local Sephora or Sephora at Kohl's. This is such a delight to be here today introducing Making It in America by Rachel Slade. Um, I just want to, Rachel, I'm very excited for this conversation. I just want to share that during my own uh, book tour for my book, um, I, my book is American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. And I wanted to wear American made clothing. And I was, I remember standing in the dressing room of Nordstrom's saying, why can't I find one thing that looks good on me that was made in America? And I I just wondered where all those companies went. So so thank you for answering my question. Um, So I just, just just to kick us off, um, can you, Tell us a little bit about the characters, your main characters, this wonderful couple you follow and their company. What are they all about? And what was what, what were they trying to create? Just introduce us, bring us into this world. Absolutely. So I'd like to introduce to the world um, Ben and Wa- Whitney Waxman. They are a husband and wife team. Um, they are from... Portland, Maine, or or they live in Portland, Maine. Actually, Whitney is not from Maine. <clears throat> She's she has lived around the world. And when they met, they were both at a moment of great transition. Um, ben had spent ten years very high up at the AFL CIO, working um, pretty closely with Rich Trumka, who unfortunately passed away. But he he was the storied president of um, the AFL-CIO, which is, which many people know, is the large umbrella federation of many unions in the United States, representing 12 million workers in so many industries. But while Ben was working with the AFL-CIO, he saw what you chronicled so beautifully in your book, Um, just factory after factory closing um, as they moved operations either south or down to Mexico or even further abroad. And that broke, that broke Ben. And when he came back to Portland, Maine, his hometown, he spent a year really just grappling with what he had witnessed in America and determined to prove that capitalism and labor could unite, could work together um, and be a force of good and rebuild community um, that he had seen um, in uh, the places where industry had left, Uh, you know, create good jobs and create amazing products. And so with me, um, he, created this company. So Whitney and Waxman together built this company called American Roots that creates all American sourced apparel. Right, right. It was, it's, an, it's just extraordinary how this, how much this company is like a unicorn, right? Uh, it's, they, they invited a union in, right? 
that or they yeah. they wanted to be union made everything sourced every thread every button sourced from the united states this is kind of what uh, you know kind of impossible right uh, you're i mean were they were they encouraged in the beginning i mean you you sort of you sort of talk a, a lot the whole book centers around their struggle to build this company that is what they think the United States needs, what they know America needs. Tell us a little bit about the obstacles that they encountered as they um, set out to make American-made clothing that was, you know, paying a living wage uh, and union union made. What were their, yeah. what were their challenges? So I, so I follow them from 2020. So I follow them over three years, but their story starts in 2015. And the obstacles that they face making apparel are the same obstacles I think that every company faces in America. Um, one of the biggest obstacles, of course, is um, just sourcing, finding companies around the country that provide the materials, as you mentioned, um, to be able to build their hoodie. Um, we are actually the second or third, America is the second or third largest producer of cotton in the world. A lot of that cotton actually goes to China to um, manufacture where goods, American goods, or where goods are made, apparel is made and then sent back to the United States. Um, so being able to notch into that supply chain is difficult when you're a small manufacturer. They had to find zippers for their hoodies. And it turns out, as far as we know, there's only one company left in America. It's out in LA that's making zippers. So supply was a big problem, establishing a, a supply line that was reliable. And then labor is always difficult. And I just mean finding people to do the job. There were very few people in Maine who had the skills that they were looking for. And so they actually had to provide training as well, which is expensive and time consuming. So what they were doing was rebuilding an industry from scratch. You know, Massachusetts and Maine um, used to be epicenters of um, shoe manufacturing and apparel manufacturing. But when all of that left America and especially this region after the passage of NAFTA in 1992, uh, the, the workers dispersed as well. And by the time Ben and Whitney were trying to build their company, they were gone. They had gone to other things. They were retired, these former apparel workers and textile workers. So they really had to rebuild the knowledge base from scratch. So I you, think you talk, you talk a lot yeah. about addition. Um, there's a one part of the book where you say the person cutting the fabric uh, they knew he struggled with addiction. Or um, you talk about how some of these young people that just didn't know how to fix the aging machines in these uh, that that were required to make cloth or, or thread. I mean, is this were there? Let me let me put it this way: Would this company have survived without immigrant labor, without without refugees? In my estimation, no. Maine is, every state is different and Maine has its own issues. And one of Maine's biggest issues is that it is the oldest state in the union. So I think I think the median age is around 50 um, and they have a great educational system, public educational system. But what tends to happen is the young people rise up through the educational system and then leave. And um, that was a that presents a serious problem for employers in Maine. Now, Ben and Whitney founded their company in Portland, well, Westbrook, which is right outside of Portland. So there's actually a very, very large immigrant community in Portland. And um, you know, at first when they started their company, like I said, they thought they would get former apparel workers who had lost their jobs after NAFTA. But what they found was that the people who were willing to do the work were what we call new Americans, people who had just received their citizenship. And many of them, yes, were political refugees um, escaping very dire conditions in the countries where they came from, including the Democratic Republic of Congo and Iraq and other places um, around the world. So they were really eager to find work 
and work hard and um, you know build a life in Maine. So I mean, it's an interesting that you paint this interesting picture of these uh, these workers, some of whom are wearing hijabs, and they're they're at these union co conventions talking about the importance of American-made stuff and American-made labor. Did, you know, was that? Um, I guess did they face some backlash? Uh, you, you you talk a little bit about the backlash they faced. That was one of the challenges I thought was interesting. So talk about the the sort of white supremacist website backlash. Mm, yeah. So I mean, let me just say that um, apparel making in America has almost always been driven driven by immigrant labor. Labor. Um, it's oftentimes the first stop for immigrants because the bar is rather low. Um, it's an apprenticeship uh, industry, so people can come in with very little knowledge, they get the training they need, and then they sit down and they start learning all these different skills. So when you think about it, you know, the mills in the United States, especially in our region, started with Irish immigrants. Uh, then it, then it, it, it moved to using immigrants from Eastern Europe and Italy and other places um, where there was civil unrest and political unrest. Um, so we are only seeing, and, and then of course it progresses and progresses and uh, the immigrant groups coming in are always changing. And at this moment in Maine, it's really about people coming from Africa. Um, but sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to establish that. Um, so yes, so in 2017, uh, one of their workers was asked to speak. They are members of the United Steel Workers, and they were asked to speak at the National Convention of United Steel Workers about, um, you know, the incredible opportunity that they had because now there was manufacturing in Maine. Now they could work at American Roots. Now they could be represented by a union. And it was a totally new concept for them to have all these things, to have representation from a union. Um, and it was a really, really rousing speech. And around that time, um, United Steelworkers also uh, put out their, I believe, quarterly magazine uh, with a photograph of one of the workers of American Roots on the cover, and she was wearing a hijab. And the company began getting calls, um, racist posts on their websites, um, on their social media. There were threats because the perception among some people, and I'm not saying that the people who were doing this were United Steelworkers members, but the perception was that these these people didn't look American, and um, therefore they were somehow taking American jobs or something else. And um, as I said before, they were the only people around willing to do the work in this case. So um, the the reaction among some people was outsized. It was horrifying for the for Ben and Whitney and the people working in the factory. But I have to say that immigrant, the immigrant community that they work with, as I said, they came from very difficult places. Democratic Repum Republic of Congo is an extremely difficult place. Um, Iraq became extremely dangerous for the people who are now working in the factory. And um, these are very resilient people because of that. And they had tremendous pride that they were finally in America. They had tremendous pride that they were being represented by a union and that their voices could be heard. And they had tremendous pride that they were making things and finally be able to settle down and be safe and take care of their families. And so in general, when these things happen and, and they've seen a lot, they've seen a lot, um, they tend to roll with it. And I was there actually when things happened. I was there on January 6th um, mm -hmm. when when the, there was the riot at the Capitol and I got to see, you know, the reaction of people on the shop floor when they found out about what was happening. I was gonna there's ask you about that, shock. how much you had to really witness, yeah. Yeah, there's shock, of course, because it's shocking that these things can happen in America. 
but then you you see it you see it just the the resolve um that we will keep going because they have kept going and a lot of them have seen a lot worse and um you know for them for for and i don't mean to speak for them but, but from what i heard speaking to folks there is that freedom for them freedom means being safe being in a community where you don't have to worry every single day whether or not your children and your spouse will come home that's freedom for them yeah yeah you you i mean the heart of the book is really this quest to make an American company that treats workers differently and, and um, you know, gives two weeks vacation off the bat, that um, gives, you know, uh, that treats workers with dignity, that has a union representation. And, um, you know, they had, you, you tell this great story about their first big order. He goes to a union uh, convention and gets an order for like, I don't know, 5,000 sweatshirts. And it's this big uh, challenge to fill the order. And then in the, you know, after they ship the first part of it, he gets a picture on his phone that says, oh, there's a problem. Tell us a little bit about what that problem was. Yeah, that was a defining moment of the company. So correct, they, they ship out the first third because they have a deadline and they're working over time to try to get the shipment out because they do not have inventory. Everything that they do, and we should talk about that, but everything that they do is made to order at the moment. They would like to get out from under that. So they're, so he had never, Ben and Whitney had never worked at that volume before. This was very early in, in the founding, of, near the founding of their company. And so they had to get a large amount of fabric in a short amount of time. And not only did they need fabric to make the 5,000 sweatshirts, but they also needed a lot of extra fabric because they were trying out this new product and they knew that there would be high level of error. Um, so there, they knew that there would be a stack of sweatshirts that didn't meet their, their demand. Um, so they had this relatively new team, a new product, and so they ordered tons of fabric. Now they didn't know how to get fabric. I mean, up to that point, they were connecting with middlemen who I guess were able to get short runs through North Carolina. So the, so the, the, uh, the um, knitting companies are in North Carolina, huge machines in huge warehouse-like buildings in North Carolina. So anyway, so yeah, so they he he at the last minute, Ben is able to locate somebody who's who says he can get them this fabric in a short amount of time. The fabric comes, they start cranking out these sweatshirts, and when they finally get shipped, it turns out that the fabric was basically what you and I would call a second. It hadn't been made properly. It would probably mixed um, different gauges or different lots of um, of yarn. Oh, cool. There were holes in the sweatshirt, right? And so were... because of that, it immediately, the fabric immediately began unraveling as soon as people started trying to wear or use these pieces. And yeah. Ben and Whitney, they're new to this game. They don't know this industry. Like a lot of people who are trying to get into manufacturing now, you know, there's a very steep learning curve. The stuff looks easy, but it is not. And they went back to their supplier and they said, you know, or the middleman in this case, and they said, what happened? And the guy basically ghosted them. Mm -hmm. They weren't going to sue because they don't have the bandwidth to do that. And they don't want to do that. They just want to get this thing right. And that's how they end up in New York City in the garment district talking to what's called a fabric contractor. So this is somebody who actually has a partner in North Carolina who works hand in hand with that partner to build the fabric basically from scratch so that it, it is perfectly designed for the, the needs of the client. Um, but he also is there to shepherd it through to make sure that the fabric is perfect. Um, and so that was a breakthrough for them, you know, for Ben and Whitney, like they learned that this was somebody who existed and somebody who was there for them. Um, and they were finally able to get the fabric that they needed and put out those sweatshirts and they 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 were perfect, they were beautiful. Um, but 
you know, steep learning curve, it almost put them out of business that that first order because they had to front the $25,000 themselves to to get the fabric, to get the new fabric. What I love what I love about that story is that it really highlights the importance of relationships because their buyer had to forgive them and wait for, you know, wait a bit longer for the delivery. And it also highlights quality and why some of our clothes are so disposable. So much of what we buy today just falls apart in a couple of years or even, you know, the clothes I buy for my daughter, they don't even last three months sometimes because the quality is so poor. And I guess I'm just curious whether you think we become sort of a disposable culture. Is that part of the what we got when we got free trade? Yeah, there's a lot of talk about planned obsolescence. We see that in our appliances, refrigerators aren't supposed to last. Well, and, and you actually write about this. Um, you know, there are components within those appliances that aren't supposed to last a day past warranty. Um, and yes, because our economy is based on consumer culture. And so if you make things that last, People aren't going to buy things. Um, when you're talking about clothes specifically, though, there's been a lot of talk about fast fashion, and I don't want to I don't want to lean too hard on that um, because so many other people talk about it um, and have written about it. But that is indeed the case that um, it actually costs a tremendous amount of money and requires a lot of research to be able to clothe ourselves with dignity. At this point, even the really high-end brands, when you look at how their um, clothes or apparel or shoes are made, it's questionable. They're using um, less and less expensive methods. It's a very cynical approach, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm a materialist, I guess you could say. I was trained as an architect. I care about the details. I care about the origins of things, obviously, but also the, the care and materials and design of things. And so I spend a lot of time, you mentioned your daughter, I spend a lot of time, yes, looking at my some of the things that my daughter has bought that she loves. And I just think this, this is barely even clothing at this point. And I actually wrote about um, Ghana. Can I do, Farah, would you mind if I just tell this quick story? Oh, sure, about yeah, go for it. Yeah, that's okay. a great story. So, um, you know those bins that are in parking lots across America where you can discard your used clothing? Yes. Maybe we have them here. We, ha we have them in New England. Um, so it's a mystery where they go. And it turns out where those clothes go. So we empty out our closets. We go through our things. There's stuff that doesn't fit, whatever. You can just toss it into a bin, close that bin, walk away. You don't have to think about it anymore. So it turns out that in the 1970s, early in the early 1970s, those clothes started going to West Africa, mostly Ghana. And when they landed in Ghana, um, the, the Africans would open up these containers and marvel at the incredible clothes that, that suddenly they, they were able to use. And um, a whole industry popped up where the Ghanans were... Um, you know, tailoring the clothes to fit them and dyeing them to appeal to the local markets and then reselling um, the clothes. And it became a huge, huge industry. And it's funny because the term for those clothes in their language was dead man's clothes because there was, they could not understand, they could not fathom the idea that a living person would get rid of their clothes. So there you have it. Um, right. And what has happened is that there's so much junk now that we're buying, a lot of it um, with toxic dyes, a lot of it with petroleum products in it, that the that this market is kind of drying up because the clothes are still going over there, but um, it's not the quality that it needs to be for, for Africans to repurpose it for their own needs. And so what's happening is it's it's literal garbage when it arrives, when they unpack it. And, um, you know, they, 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 it ends up clogging up the waterways. And if, if you look online, you can see photos of 
our clothes, our junk, basically, um, you know, in, in enormous landfills all over West Africa now, because there's, there, there, it's, it's all over, it's all over the continent. I used to live in East Africa and the secondhand markets were, I mean, amazing there. It's interesting that Rwanda has banned secondhand clothes from, from coming. They're like, nope, we're not into this. And I, you know, some people credit it with uh, the rise of a uh, indigenous, uh, you know, cloths, you know, in, in Rwanda, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's, a, it's very interesting to see this uh, come full circle. Has this book, writing this book, changed the way you shop? Do you, do you wear different clothes now? I, I have to say that this is, I'm wearing Taylor J. It took me a year or two after writing my book to find that Oakland had a whole bunch of uh, American-made, American-designed clothing. It's not cheap, but if you, if you only want to have a few. Uh, really well-made things it's you know you can find great stuff um so this is taylor j that i'm wearing right now do you do you shop differently now oh good to know i i didn't know about taylor, taylor j i'll look them up Ooh. um i have always been obsessed with this um it comes from my parents my dad always bought american cars he made a really really big deal about buying american and um also buying union and so that I just internalized. And uh, so forever in a day, I have always tried to buy American when I can. Um, and I can name a whole bunch of companies that I rely on. There's a lot of bait and switch. Um, you know, when you look up American made companies on the internet, they're, they're aggregators who list bunch, you know, tons of companies. And unfortunately it requires a tremendous amount of research just to confirm that your stuff will actually be made in the US. Um, there are lots of companies that that trumpet designed in America. In fact, yeah, a lot of clothes are designed in America, but they're not made here. So um, in terms of changing how I shop, I guess I've always been that really annoying person who was always looking for American made. Um, there's some things I think that are difficult to find here, but there's some things that are not so hard to find here. Um, when you're talking about clothing, um, obviously American roots for all your sweatshirts, um, but also there's a really large apparel making industry in LA. Yeah, we probably a lot of people know about American Apparel, uh, which kind of thrived, then died, then revived. Um, there's also Bella and Luna that makes T-shirts in LA. Um, but if you look, you can find them. You just have to be clever about your search um, and do a lot of confirming. There have been times actually when I've been on the internet, when I'm looking at a product and I will literally zoom in on the tag because I don't trust the copy or the mm -hmm. copy isn't clear. And so I'll zoom in on the tag to confirm that it says made in USA. But, the, but, but things are really out there. And I've noticed also um, when I go to Instagram that when you start following one American made company, the others pop up in your, but I guess that's that's one benefit of algorithms. Um, so I do appreciate that. And finally, I I would urge Amazon uh, uh, to to include one more search feature. You know, when you search for something on Amazon, however you feel about Amazon, people use Amazon. Um, and along the left, you can check and uncheck boxes about brands and size and color and all stuff. I really wish that Amazon would add one more little box that said made in USA. That's Again, that would require yeah. a lot of work on their yeah. part because somebody would have to actually vet the claim. But um, I just think it would help all of us because stuff is out there. It's not expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. Yes, some of it is expensive, but some of it isn't. Um, but if we really care about supporting American workers and also getting around the awful guilt, right, that right. you feel when you buy something, you don't quite know its origins, you don't quite know who made it, getting around that 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 concern, um, if you care about that, then a little box would be super helpful for, for shoppers who want to do good and um, don't have the time to be super animal like me about the research. All right, I want to go deeper, deeper into sort of you and this writing process. Um, you're obviously the author of a very well received book, Into the Raging Sea, about um, uh, the sinking of a container ship, right, a, a cargo ship. 
did that is that where you sort of started in being interested in supply chains? You have a passion for supply chains. Where where did it I come? I do. I'm, I'm such a nerd. Um, <laughs> So I wrote about El Faro, which was a container ship, an American container ship that sunk in 2015. Um, all 33 people aboard perished when the ship sunk. And yes, that really began to connect me with the idea that 90% of everything that we touch, everything that we use, everything that we buy, spend some time on a container ship. When I first started giving talks about that book, I would start with that fact and people kind of look around like oh really you know they look at their shoes which obviously were made probably in vietnam and they looked at the chairs which may have been made in china and you know i i think i think it's it made a little bit of an impact but then the pandemic right and i was pleased to see i mean the news was terrible but i was pleased to see that finally our dependency on imported goods was making headlines we saw that these ports in la um in savannah in new york were completely backed up that there were dozens of ships offshore coming from abroad full of stuff waiting to be unloaded and um you know american manufacturers who depended on imported components were suddenly totally hamstrung, including America's audio auto industry. So um, I thought, ah, you know, this is the perfect moment for me to um, bring my my deep interest in in material goods, where they're made, how they're made, and combine that with my deep interest in shipping and supply chains and maybe make a good story out of it too. Something that people would actually enjoy reading, um, trying to get away from um, or hoping very much that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a dry read. So that's why I was thrilled when I found Ben and Whitney because their story is so gripping and the people who they work with um, tell such incredible stories about their journeys to manufacturing. So I, I kind of want to go into sort of more the more politics here. I mean, your book touches on something that I think is little discussed, but very, uh, very important. So for the past 30 years uh, in America, or let's say prior to 2016, for 30 years, we had both Democrats and Republican presidents very gung-ho about free trade. And then since... Trump, uh, both Trump and Biden have been very skeptical of free trade. And so, you know, despite all the polarization, we, we sort of are seeing a change in uh, attitude about free trade. Um, you know, do you credit Trump with this change? Well, Trump certainly brought the issue to the fore and so did many of the people who voted for him. I think absolutely there is a strong narrative that as workers lost their jobs, which you described in beautiful detail in your book, um, there was nothing left to replace the infrastructure that supported them. And um, that was a fact. And I think it, it remained hidden from a lot of people for a long time. And now those stories are really being told um, in very gripping ways and important ways. And um, now I think we understand that if you leave people behind, although the country has been prosperous on paper, if you leave large segments of the population behind, um, they will finally find their voice and um, put in politicians who speak their language. Um, you know, it, it certainly Trump revealed that um, this is an issue and a large percentage of the population has been deeply impacted by the loss of manufacturing. Biden has done, in my opinion, really amazing things to right the ship. Um, I think what he is trying to do and what I, what I hope he is able to achieve is a true industrial policy, like one that we haven't seen in years, 
we're competing with countries like Germany and China and Vietnam and lots of other countries around the world that have true industrial policies that put manufacturing first. And we haven't had a real industrial policy um, in, in a very, very long time, one that, that understands the importance of manufacturing. Um, you know, you, you talk about in your book and I talk about in my book that a lot of big thinkers or a lot of powerful people in the 80s and 90s were happy to leave manufacturing behind as if manufacturing were something that Americans no longer should deign to do. And obviously we're seeing the reper repercussions of that from a political standpoint. There's been a sea change in how we talk about politics or, or policy. Um, but I think also the, the other thing that's happening is that we're realizing that we cannot depend on imports um, because it affects how we deal with countries on, any, on the international stage. It compromises our ability to, to advocate for human rights, to advocate for unions, to advocate for environmental um, protections in other places because we're so dependent on those places for basic things like medicine. I'm sure you're aware that 90% of our medicines come from India and China. And that really, really was shocking, I think, to a lot of people when we started experiencing shortages right after the pandemic or when the pandemic started. So I would say that, um, you know, Trump certainly spoke that language, that grievance language that a lot of um, people who had been in manufacturing feared for their jobs or had lost their jobs had felt. But I think there was nothing like the pandemic to really drive home the repercussions of the choices that we had made by, by neglecting manufacturing as an important part of American life. So I'm curious about, I mean, I'm curious about whether you ever had self-doubt about your um, very strong view that we have to get back to um, manufacturing here. It was such an unpopular view for a long time. And there's so many people who are concerned that if we retreat behind these two big, beautiful oceans that protect us, if we just, you know, bring everything home, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to cede leadership to China because China's trading, China's, uh, China's um, building infrastructure all over the world. I know your your book isn't like a geopolitical book, but I'm curious, you know, I, I, I wrestle with this. I'm somebody who, who very much believes in this message that we need to get back to making things again and we should care about jobs, not just how cheap our stuff is. But I, I, I do, you know, I do wonder sometimes what is the appropriate level of self-sufficiency? Should we be able to make everything 100%? You know, did, did you come away with some thoughts on what's the right balance? Yeah. Well, when you're talking about doubt, of course, I always have doubt. We all have doubt. I mean, but the doubt wasn't so much whether or not Americans should be making things and whether or not this should be the thrust of policy moving forward. Um, my doubt was whether people would care. Um, <laughs> As, as you've shown in your book and as I, as I have discovered in mine, um, you know, there are 350 million Americans, maybe now 360, I haven't kept up on our population, but um, a huge part of that population would like to make things. They're not, they don't want to sit in front of a cu uh, computer. They don't want to answer phone calls. Um, they want to be in a community that produces things, that makes things. It's also... Um, no question about it, environmentally better for us to be making more things. Um, a large a percentage of the cost of imported goods actually is in the transportation costs, and that has 
you know, real serious environmental repercussions. Um, so, so there's the labor piece of it, like what should Americans be doing? There's the environmental piece of it, which is if things are made more locally and domestically, um, that really reduce the environmental costs of those things, especially since we do have, you know, environmental regulations in place um, to try to contain some of the fallout of production. Um, but but most importantly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the economic um, factors here. When you spend a dollar in your local community, it actually, studies have found that it bounces around that community three or four times before it goes out, you know, goes to maybe national or international. So it's really quite amazing um, when you when you support domestic manufacturing, how many people that lifts up. It's not just the workers who are working in the factories, but it's everything that they touch, right? So it's, the, yeah, it, it has such a compounding effect. So it's it's their children, right, are, are now, you know, <laughs> are impacted by that, but it's also the accountants, the lawyers, like all kinds of white collar jobs that um, sprout up around supporting manufacturing and supporting workers. It's it's um, restaurants and food and supermarkets and all kinds of things when you have a community now that is anchored by industry. So when you buy something, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about Amazon for just a sec. You know, when you buy something from Amazon, oftentimes you're buying it directly from a Chinese supplier. And um, I don't wanna single out the Chinese because this is now happening globally, but um, a lot of those Chinese manufacturers are, are um, deeply subsidized by their government. Their shipping is deeply subsidized by their government, which means that the price that you pay for that good actually doesn't reflect the actual cost of that good. And one more thing, when you buy directly from China through Amazon, your dollars go straight out of the country. It's not supporting anybody um, except, you know, the, the shipper. So, the, you know, the, the local shipper, which is something, but it's, it's pretty minimal. So, you know, you compare that to what happens when you buy something made in America. And as, as I just pointed out, you know, it has such a compounding effect on the economy, not to mention the tax base that it's supporting, because now you have American workers who are working in America, earning an income here and paying taxes on that income. It's just it's just so profound, um, the impact of, of your dollars um, when you do buy domestically made goods. You're talking so, about cost. Yeah, to, to doubt, I had no doubt that I was on the right side of history. The question was, what kinds of people would listen? What kinds of people would care? And um, how much do we care? How, yeah. how convincing is this argument to get people to care so much that we actually shift policy and shift our consumer behaviors? Yeah, you're talking about cost. Tell us what one of these hoodies costs. Okay, well, of... I do wanna say that, the, that American Roots is generally not direct to consumer. As I mentioned before, and this is, this is part of the story, they don't have inventory. Um, so you can actually buy a sweatshirt from them. I think their zip sweatshirt, which by the way, has a metal zipper and takes 45 minutes to make all American sourced. I think it is now at $110. However, that is the um, consumer price. And um, when when they take bulk orders, there's there's room in that pricing. Now that's a lot of money, but then you think about I mean, what people spend on multiples of things because things don't last very long. And then you compare that to an American Roots hoodie, which I'm probably going to be, you know, bequeathing to my grandchildren. It's built so darn well. Um, then you start to think that maybe this is an investment piece. Again, that's not true for all of American made goods. I want to make that super clear. American made goods are not necessarily more expensive than imported goods, but they're harder to find in many cases. Also, yeah. if I if I if you don't mind my just one more more note is that, you know, the hoodie, which the, which American Roots manufactures, is an American product. It was designed here, was made here, was made for American workers. Um, and of course, it's copied now all over the world. 
um, right. intellectual property rights and protecting those for um, American companies is also a key component to developing effective industrial policy to protect the things that we develop and invent from, you know, just being fabricated elsewhere and then dumped right back into this country at very low prices. So your book is this um, wonderful uh, accumul uh, uh, collection of little histories. Uh, in, in addition to the people, you talk about all you know history of wool and its impact on the British Empire. You you get into all these histories. Um, it's and and it's also sort of a manifesto against free trade. But but there's a there's a way in which it's a big celebration of businesses and small businesses and businesses that actually care about their workers. Um, I, I guess I I. I'm, you know, I'm just wondering if you think that that the way we talk about business in this country uh, should change, because so much of the rhetoric um, we hear is about businesses paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, not too much has been said, uh, you know, about how they treat their workers or what are their missions, you know, their, their mission itself. So I guess I'm just curious what whether you intended to lift up business people, or small business people. You know, that's a really great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I, I mean, we live in a capitalist society. There's very little redistribution of, of wealth. I mean, it happens through taxes, but generally speaking, like people have to work. And um, unless you work for the government, you're working for business. Um, and uh, I absolutely want to celebrate the entrepreneurs out there who are trying to do three things, in my opinion, the right way, like Ben and Whitney, like companies all across America. I think when we talk about business the way you're talking about it, I suspect a lot of that is focused on these extremely large multinational companies uh, like Nike, for example. These are companies that are American, certainly they have headquarters in America, but they're really multinational companies. And what they're doing, and I, I don't mean to single out Nike because the big brands, all the big brands do this, H&M, Zara, what they're doing is they are finding the cheapest places to manufacture their goods, and that's how they keep prices low. So they're pitting countries against countries, and they're pitting small factories against small factories. So in, in Vietnam, in Bangladesh, you have all these small business people who set up factories and get contracts with these multinational brands, and then... Um, you know, and then find themselves really squeezed because the, the brands are dictating the pricing. And so the manufacturers have to figure out how to make things cheaper. It's extremely cruel and destructive. And the other problem is that this capital, you know, the capital from these multinational brands is um, nationless. So when a country fails them, um, say Bangladesh fails them somehow, they can look for new places to manufacture. So it really is pitting um, countries against countries, uh, small contractors against small contractors. This is all business, right? This is the state of global business. This is, this is globalization. But we can run an end run, we can do an end run around this craziness, this um, tragedy by, again, supporting small businesses in America who are trying, again, to do things right. So, so the, um, again, your book really, um, it, how do I say this? It gets at something, uh, it's beyond, you know, tariffs, beyond free trade, almost beyond industrial policy, there's a point at which you say um, domestic, but domestic manufacturing would only succeed if a majority of business leaders shifted their goals from profit to sustainability, from growth to equilibrium. 
and and you you quote Ben saying, if you can't figure out a way to keep your shareholders happy and your workers employed with living wages, retirement and benefits, you're not doing your job. I mean, what you're calling for is really kind of a, a reimagination of capitalism itself. Is that isn't that a heavy lift? <laughs> well, or I, are we getting there? Are I would seeing- I would argue, I would I would argue that point. Um, that's I would say that's not true. Um, but there was a moment when American companies f- cared very much about their stakeholders, right? So their stakeholders not just in included not just shareholders, but everybody who worked for them and all the people in their orbit who were impacted by the decisions that they were making. There was a sea change, a real change, as as you know, because you've written about it, um, when corporations finally found a theoretical um, uh, construct that would support their uh, interest in chasing cheap labor through Milton Friedman, through the free trade economics folks at the University of Chicago way back in the 70s. That it took a while for the idea that companies should only be beholden to shareholders. Um, But once that concept took flight, once enough people uh, in power decided, yeah, like we should care more about the stock market than about the health of of workers, um, that's when basically my life started, right? So I I mean, and I'm talking about 1980, you know, the chips start falling or late 70s, you know, the things, the, the zeitgeist changed. It's been incredibly destructive. We know it's been incredibly destructive. All I'm saying is pause, stop. We tried that. We see the repercussions. Let's get back to where we were, but let's do it better. Um, let's make sure that we're clu- including all workers in this. Um, and because, as as you know, um, union history is a little sketchy when it comes to people of color and women. Um, so I think now in this moment, now that we've been through the pandemic, now that we know the stakes of offshoring everything, um, I, I think this is a clarion call to rediscover what we used to have, that a working person, one working person could take care of a family of four. One working person didn't need a college degree to have a good job. Um, One person could work in a factory or a business for 30 years and get a pension at the end. This is not crazy stuff. It's happening right now. American workers at every level are unionizing. I just saw in um, the New York Times that doctors are starting to unionize. Yeah. Nurses yeah, have true. been unionized, but doctors are unionizing. And now there's a call among the younger generation for pensions. I never thought, thought I would see that in my mm-hmm. lifetime. Most of us, are, our retirements shifted to 401ks, which meant that companies were no longer connected to us once we left. Pensions bind you to your employer for life. It's, it's a really interesting concept. It used to be ubiquitous, now it's rare. But I think, you know, as kids, as, as younger people, as my daughter, who's 22, are looking around, they're asking more of capitalism. They're asking more of government, but also more of capitalism to take care of them so that they can give back in good faith. I think I think I want, there's I just want to jump in here because we have we have only a few minutes left, and I really want to ask right. you about okay. unions because you, you're you're um, you're mentioning all of the victories we've seen recently. Biden is the most pro-union president of my lifetime. Why don't more union members uh, seem to like him? Oh, I, I think he has really strong support from unions, um, certainly at the top. And I think, I think, I mean, messaging is always very difficult in my pers- from my perspective for liberals and Democrats because we have a tendency, I think, to take every issue and kind of explode it and make it about 
a lot of things. So it's very difficult, I think, for Democrats in particular to distill things to talking points, to distill issues to talking points. Case in point, you and I have been talking for an hour. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I hope that the messaging gets out. You're right. Biden is the most pro-union um, president that we have seen probably since Bull Johnson, I would say. Mm -hmm. And that is reflected in um, the, the power of organizers to get people to start thinking about unionizing because they have support at the very top. That hasn't been easy to, to reconfigure the nation to support the courts and the nation to, re to, to support collective bargaining. Um, but I think there's so demand for it that moving forward, whoever is in power will absolutely have to support unions and not just, you know, talking the talk, but really walking the walk and standing side by side with people who want to unionize. But again, I want to be clear that we're talking about different levels of business, right? There are these multinational corporations and they are monopolists and they do run a lot of um, production. So a lot of the things that we get are made by these huge companies. Um, and there are very few of them out there, obviously, and they're controlling a lot of what we buy and use. But th you can do an end run around this by by looking for the smaller brands that that are working locally within their communities to um, support workers. So we only have like maybe two minutes left, and I just wanted to sort of uh, give you it's it's holiday season. It's it's uh, you know a lot of people are going out Christmas shopping. Like you know, give us your quick elevator speech about what you want to leave people with at this moment when they're about to go spend a bunch of money. Yeah. All right. If you spend $10 on a locally made, I mean, domestically made good, that $10 is an investment and it will pay off. We have seen that it can multiply, it can double, it can triple in the United States, it can grow the tax base, it supports all kinds of um, people within the broader network that are holding up whatever industry um, produced that good. I can't think of a more beautiful gift than, um, than supporting domestic industry. Um, it's, I think, I mean, I, I would even dare to say that it's in some ways better than charity um, because it is the gift that keeps on giving. It keeps on, that, those dollars keep on bouncing around and growing and um, allowing other entrepreneurs and other workers to find opportunities within our economy um, to, to lay down roots and to support each other. So just give yeah. it a minute, just give it another look, whatever it is that you're looking for. It, it, there is an analog, there is a product made in America. You, you just have to spend one more minute looking for it. Um, and if, if you're having trouble finding that product, definitely Google USA made, American made. There are websites out there committed to compiling lists of manufacturers, but you will find them um, you know, the search engines are out there, the algorithms are out there. And keep yep. Googling that stuff, even uh -huh. if you can't find it, because yeah. it it will also communicate um, to businesses that, like, this is important to you. Yep, yep. Well, we, with that, we are out of time. Hopefully people will uh, be able to buy your book at their local bookstore, Making It in America. Rachel Slade, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks. This has been an honor. Thanks so much. Sarah, it was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you are interested in podcasts about nonfiction books, listen to C-SPAN's Book Notes Plus podcast for interviews with authors and historians hosted by Brian Lamb.